So today's topic is checking condo status certificates, pass or fail. So why do I call it pass or fail? Is there a reason I'm calling it pass or fail? Anyone? Anyone? Has anyone heard? Uh, you can go ahead and waive your condition. The lawyer picks up the phone. He says, go ahead and waive your condition or it's a pass. Is that good? Is that a good news for you? Who says it's bad news to hear it's a pass? Anyone? I'm fishing for participation. You can unmute yourself and just tell me what you think. How about if the lawyer says it's a fail? Don't go ahead. I found a problem. Have you ever heard that? Are those proper answers after a lawyer checks a status certificate? Should a lawyer be checking a status certificate? Is that a lawyer's job to check a status certificate? Do lawyers study status certificates in uh, law school? How do they learn about status certificates? What is a status certificate? Why am I talking about status certificates as if I don't know anything? I do know a lot about status certificates because I've been reviewing them. I've reviewed thousands and thousands of status certificates and I never say pass or fail. I've never once said pass or fail. Usually I have some comments and I never say pass or fail. And there's a reason for that. Who makes the decision whether to go forward or not? Is everyone hearing me? Because I'm not hearing any, any chat. The buyer or... makes the decision. Oh, thank you so much. Who said that? Isabel. Now Isabel, I'm going to stop talking. you are talking. so wonderful and, be, and brave too. But I've actually, the buyer, Isabel's 100% right. The client decides based on the information we give them. And my job is to review it and give them a conclusion, give them some kind of um, a summary of information. So, so, you should, so what am I reviewing? I'm reviewing a lot of documents that are in the condo status certificate. So before I go forward, I should introduce myself. I know there's 42 people here and some people may not have met me. Uh, all you need to know is my name is John Polides. I'm a real estate lawyer. My email address is above, and I've also given you my direct mobile number. So when I say extension 24 seven, I'm not kidding. I do answer calls on real estate. I do help your clients with their closings, whether it's buying or selling, uh, residential or commercial real estate, purchase or sale of businesses. We do a lot of business closings. We do franchise law, commercial leasing, wills and estates. We probate, uh, estates all the time. We help people with estate planning. Uh, and in addition to that, we do all the corporate law that they may need. Usually we do it in connection to real estate, although we have a few corporate law clients that only need corporate law. And we do work for franchisors as well as franchisees. Okay. Uh, what qualifies me to be talking to you today is I'm a real estate lawyer. But in addition to that, I've been a registrant since the 80s. And and I've studied real estate at York University. Uh, and, and I've also been lecturing on real estate for over 30 years. So I was uh, an ARIA instructor in the late 80s. And currently I'm an instructor for Real Estate Institute. So for Real Estate Institute, I'm qualified to teach three courses, real estate legal issues, real estate ethics, and real estate commercial leasing. So the one I, my favorite course is real estate legal issues because I get a lot of latitude and to what I add to the topic. And it's also the shortest course of the three. It's only two days, two full days instead of three or five days. Um, what else can I tell you? So why are we talking about status certificates? Why do we have status certificates? Who made up the idea of status certificates? Status certificates have been around for a long time. Does anyone know what a status certificate is? Who produces a status certificate? A condo corporation. Exactly, the condo corporation will, will compile and produce and give it to us on request. Uh, but why do we have it? What law makes them give it to us? Is there a law that says you must give a status certificate? Okay, so who says we need a status certificate? Is it written in the contract? Should you be putting a status condition? What law enables us to get a status certificate? So status certificates are a form of consumer protection. That's what a status certificate is. 
because what we're buying is not only our unit, our dwelling, our pie in the sky, what we are buying is rights that, that coexist with everyone else's rights in the building. So that's the fractional share of the whole building. We have a proportionate share, and we also have liability for anything that's gone on in the whole building, whether it's past or present or future, we have that liability. So once we buy into a condo, we are actually, uh, it's like buying a business. So if you buy shares in the stock market, how much research do you do on the shares in advance? When you buy shares in the, in the stock market, do you look at earnings? Do you look at uh, the history of the company? Do you look at past losses? Do you look at how many uh, presidents they've had and uh, how many times the administration has changed? So this basically the status certificate is a document for all the outsiders. It has a lot of outsider information and it has a lot of information uh, about financial, inf financial and legal information about the building. So it's up to us to take advantage of the protection that's in the Condo Act by demanding the status certificate. So how do you get this protection? You have to request the status certificate and you need a condition. So what is the status certificate? What's included in it? Why is it important? I think we've already covered that. Who can request it? Who should request it? Who usually requests it? There's no rule of who, who should or could request it. In the GTA area, usually the seller requests it because we put it in the offer that the seller will provide it to the buyer at the seller's expense. So we'll have a status condition. That's what's common. But the agreement of purchase in sale allows us to request it. Um, sometimes it's hard to request it because the property manager may not want to give a status certificate to an outsider. Uh, that's very rare. Uh, but generally speaking, we try to get the seller to provide it. Uh, and, if, and the sooner he can provide it, the better, so we can make a conclusion. So the seller should request it. And what does it cost? How do you get it? He has to request it and he has to pay a fee. How much is the fee? 100 bucks is the statutory amount that the condo corporation can charge us. But I hear from some people that they're paying more. Why do they pay more? Because they're happy to pay more. They want to give them a tip. Okay, so some Mike says rush request. So, so who would you request a rush request from? From the property manager or from someone else? How much does a rush request cost? So I've heard numbers, and correct me if I'm wrong, I've heard numbers of 150 to 250 for a rush request. Has anyone seen a, web, a website or a second, a third, third party? service provider who provides status certificates. Do you know their names? So Condo Cafe is one of them and Conduit, Conduit.com is another one. So, but, but they don't actually prepare the, the status certificate. They are facilitators uh, to get it done faster. And sometimes you need it faster for whatever reason. So there's a cost to, to, uh, to getting it. Uh, who, the Condo Corporation prepares it, who reads it? Does the Condo Act say a lawyer should read it? Has anyone ever had a client that read their own? Is there a problem with them reading their own? Yes. Okay, why is that a problem? It's a huge problem. We don't have a law degree. I, I did a, a condo deal on a condo townhouse just recently, and um, the listing agent on the night of the offer, the multiple offers, showed up and said to me, here's the status certificate, you read it, and then you can take the condition out. And I said, I think you have me confused with somebody who has a law degree. I have a license to buy and sell trade in real estate, but I don't have a law degree. So there you go. Yeah, I, I will tell you that th that's not the main reason. That's, that may be one of the reasons, uh, but, but uh, the reality is the client needs to go to someone who's gonna explain it to them or they can read it on their own. So it is possible they can read it on their own. The problem with them reading it on their own is they're not going to understand all of the contents. And let me tell you that uh, most of the contents, uh, I would say 30% are legal and 70% are financial. Does that make sense? So there's a lot of financial information in the status certificate and I will talk to you about that. That's, that's the sensitive information. Recently, I had a call from a seller who was selling a, 
a condo with two parking and they were told by their agent that they had to sell the two parking together, that they didn't want, they, that their condo corporation restricted the sale of the one parking to a third party. So they had to get rid of it. And uh, uh, my answer to them was, why don't I read the status? And the status has a page in the declaration that said, you can sell your parking separately, but it has to be someone who's an owner of the building, of, of one of the units in the building. So there's a reason they do that. They restrict who can use it. They restrict the use or the leasing to people who are living in the building uh, or who own a unit in the building. And that's for their personal security. And that's a reasonable restriction. But it doesn't stop the seller from, hold, from retaining the unit and selling it to an owner later on. The restriction was not on us retaining it. The restriction was on who we could sell it to. So that, that was, anyone could have read that. That was on one of the pages of the declaration. The difference between uh, another buyer and me reading it is I know where to look. I know where to look. It's gonna take me two minutes to read it because I've read, I've read thousands of these and they've never read one and they may spend hours reading it and they may have to go through every page of the status which is hundreds of pages. So the idea is, is in Ontario, we seem to have lawyers reading the status certificates uh, although they're not more particularly qualified than, than accountants, uh, and some lawyers have never read one because they don't practice real estate law. So the idea is, is that someone who has a knowledge of status certificates should be reading it uh, and have the ability to explain it to the client. Uh, what the status certificate tells us are what are the obligations of the condo corporation to us and us to the condo corporation. Uh, what I recommend always is to have a status certificate condition. So usually the status certificate condition has names a lawyer as the person to review the status certificate. That's not law, that's just practice. So it could be the buyer reviewing the status certificate and, and being satisfied with it. So basically status certificate is a prescribed form. Uh, currently we call it a form one, formerly it was called a form 13. Prescribed form means a document that's being dictated to us by the Condominium Act. Uh, that's a fill in the blanks document. So if you want to be a, a property manager and make a hundred bucks, you find the document from the Condo Act and fill in the blanks. And that's your hundred bucks. How long should that take you? You have to know something about the building before you fill it out. Does that make sense? So the status certificate is a prescribed form but that's not the only document that's included. Because when I review a status, I'm not happy with reading the form 13 or the form one. There's a reason for that. Because I wanna see every supporting document. The supporting documents are what support what I'm reading in the status certificate. Why do I wanna see the supporting documents? Because I do not want to be happy with someone else's interpretation. I don't want their interpretation and them to tell me it's okay, go ahead and waive your condition. I wanna see the source documents that support what I'm reading. So if I'm looking at a budget, if I'm looking at financials, if I'm looking at the declaration, I have to see them all with my own eyes and see if they, if they conform with what's written in the status certificate, uh, which, I, which I told you form 13 or form one, the, the disclosure document that's contained in a regulation to the Condo Act. So remember, I told you the Condo Act is a form of consumer protection and the status certificate is a disclosure document with minimum disclosures that we should know. When you're buying a condo, you cannot know these things easily. There's no website that says they have to post it all. So the condo, the condo status certificate will tell us who the current directors are, the property managers and the address for service. It'll tell us information about our units. Are we buying a dwelling with a parking? Is there a parking and locker? Sometimes there can be a dwelling and two parkings included. Uh, the whole idea is, is the only way for me to find info about the units is to do a title search. And quite often we're not committed to doing a title search until we firm up the deal. And sometimes certain types of parking and locker are hard to figure out without a search or without reading the declaration and any document general that's been registered. 
And the reason for that is sometimes parking and locker are not owned, but ra rather they're exclusive use, leased or licensed. And that may or may not be on the status certificate. We also will find out in the status certificate form one, what are the maintenance fees? And if there's any default in payment, is that important? Have you ever seen a maintenance fee different from the listing in the status certificate? Why would it be different? Yeah, sometimes you have a, an, an increase and because your status certificate was produced prior to the increase taking effect. So your status certificate may be a few days old or a few weeks old. And then the increase took place, the increase may take place uh, at the time that you've received the status or the increase may take place when? It may take place just before the closing. So sometimes the year end of a condo corporation does not coincide with a fiscal year end. That means the calendar year. So we should find out when the year end is. Uh, have you ever heard of a person walking away because of an increase? Sometimes people do walk away. So if it's a big increase, it might throw them off in their budget or, or put them into trouble. I had one lady who walked away from a condo for a $10 increase. How's that possible? It was only 5%. Well, after, actually for her, it was the $10. And I'll tell you why, because uh, before she saw the unit, she was told one maintenance fee and uh, she was told 450. When she saw the unit, the agent uh, corrected the maintenance fee to 460 or 470. And then when she made the offer and we reviewed the status, it was 480. So for her, she felt that it wasn't properly disclosed to her. That was for her $30 because her budget was 450. She didn't want to go over 450 in maintenance fees. And what she said to me is $30 a month is the cost of my cell phone. And I'll have to give something up. I'm on a fixed income. That is possible. It is rare. Usually when people see a small increase, a small increase keeping in line with inflation, uh, they don't complain much. And, and when I explain to them that a small increase is a healthy thing, it's a good thing for the condo corporation, because if they don't do these increases annually, what will happen? If they don't do the increases annually, they will have to catch up in one lump sum increase sometime in the future. So basically, maintenance fees are something that we look at. I compare them to the agreement of purchase and sale. I look at increases in maintenance fees and the history of increases. I look at assessments. What's an assessment? It's good and bad. It depends on who pays it, right? So if, if we're a buyer and the assessment has been levied to be paid at the end of the year, December 31st, 2020, and we close at the beginning of December, who's going to pay the assessment? They used to call these special assessments. These are lump sum payments to catch up. What are we catching up with? Catching up on the reserve fund? Yeah, we could be catching up on the reserve fund, or we could be catching up with a budget. The budget may have an underfunding, or the reserve fund may have an underfunding. So remember that a condo corporation has two bank accounts. One bank account is the general account that takes care of the day-to-day -day needs. It pays the property manager, it pays the utilities, it pays whatever expenses there are. And the other account is the, is the reserve fund which takes care of all capital items 25 years into the future. So when you own a house, do you have a reserve fund? You don't have a reserve fund. The only reserve fund you have is your pocket or a line of credit against your house. So if you have to pay for a $20,000 roof or if you have a foundation problem, you're gonna pay for it from your own pocket. So the reserve fund is the pocket of the condo corporation that should take into account all capital items. So basically assessments can be good if they're done prior to our ownership because that means they've caught up with any underfunding. But if they happen after our ownership, if we're buying, uh, they, they may visit us. So if, if, we, if I find an assessment in the status certificate, what should I be doing? Should I tell the client, this, this status is a failure. Can I say that? They're gonna think I'm crazy if I say that, right? Why is that? 
It's not my job to fail the status certificate. It's my job to make them aware of costs. And if I make them aware of costs, then I'm doing my job. So if I see an assessment and the condo corporation has levied a, a, a 500,000 assessment, is that a deal breaker? How do I deal with this assessment? So for my client's gonna want to know that they're not gonna pay 500,000, that they're gonna pay their share of the 500,000. So paying their share of the 500,000 will require me to calculate their share based on their percentage of ownership. So if their ownership is uh, one tenth of 1% of 500,000, how much is their share? A tenth of 1% is $500. So will my client complain if they have to pay 500 bucks at the end of the year? Maybe, maybe not, or they may ask the seller. But if it's a bigger amount, if it's 1%, they won't be too happy because it's a larger amount. It may be $5,000. So, so an assessment, uh, although it's good for the financial health of the building, it depends on who it touches. So if it touches the buyer, the buyer is going to want to switch the burden to the seller. If there's a history of a lot of special assessments, or that means there's a history of a lot of chronic underfunding and the board of directors and the property manager are not doing their job. So if I find a history of a lot of special assessments, I will tell the client, we've had special assessments every year over the past three years because they didn't do their um, uh, proper reserve fund study and they're not accumulating enough money in the reserve fund and it's underfunded. So all I have to tell them is the numbers. So the client wants to know numbers and all numbers can be solved by financial uh, compensation from the seller. So let me tell you what's not included in the status certificate. So I'm going to speed up a little bit because I'm not a third done yet. Uh, you don't have an inspection by the, a representative of the condo corporation. Why is that important? Sometimes a seller or a prior seller, prior owner may have done renovations to the unit that are not in keeping with the condo declaration. So most condo declarations have a page or two in, in the declaration called the standard unit bylaw. So the standard unit bylaw tells us what the finishes are. Uh, and if we don't have an inspection, we don't know if the, if the unit complies, it may be in violation of the standard unit bylaw and it may cause us to have to do some work there. So obviously the best uh, status certificate is with an inspection of the condo corporation. This is very rare and some property managers refuse to inspect because it's liability for them. I have found units that have had extensive renovations that are non-compliant in absence of a condo representative, representative inspecting. Uh, sometimes we'll get a, a home inspector to inspect. It doesn't tell us about sm small claims court cases or cases that are being mediated. It does tell us about superior court of justice, lawsuits. So those are important to know. It doesn't tell us about work orders. Are work orders or fire code work orders important to us? It doesn't tell us about the number or types of pets. It does tell us the pet rule. So if you don't know your neighbor has two pit bull terriers, uh, how happy will you be when you find out? I know some people love pit bull terriers I love all dogs, but some people are afraid. Or what if they have a Rottweiler or a Great Dane? And how would you feel about getting into the elevator with a Great Dane, right? Uh, it doesn't tell us about the history of property managers, history of increase in maintenance fees, history of special assessments, or history of settled insurance claims. It does not tell us about deficiencies like high-tech plumbing. Although nowadays I see more and more status certificates have a high, do a high tech clause. There is a clause in the status where they can write whatever they want, but high tech can exist either in the unit itself, or it may exist in the common areas of the building. Either way, it's gonna cost you money if high tech is still there. Thankfully, most of the high tech in buildings has been remediated, but I can still tell you that uh, I would say one in 10, one in 20 that we review, we find high tech mentioned uh, and we always recommend an inspection from, for Kitech because these are mysteries. Uh, this is what's included in the status certificate. This is what I actually review. So I not only review the status, I review the supporting docu documents. So tell me, go ahead, I, I heard a question. Um, 
Hi, it's Christine. Um, I was just going to ask you about the Kitec plumbing. You mentioned that um, it doesn't show up in the um, what's not included, but how would you find out if it's in the building? I know the inspector would inspect the unit, but they don't inspect the actual building. That's a great question. Usually I recommend uh, a representation and warranty to go in. So I would like a seller's warranty and representation. Does that make sense? Uh, and and I, I would combine it with an inspection. John, it is not it is not mandatory to disclose the plumbing. No, it's not. It's not. But there may be liability if they don't disclose. Okay, there may be liability. A lot of property managers are disclosing it now, but it's not a line item. It's not a line item in the status certificate. But there is, there is a, at the end of the status certificate, there's a blank area where they can write about anything they want. And sometimes they write about Kitec. Uh, when I review a status, I always recommend a Kitec warranty or a Kitec inspection. I, I do that every single time. It's not because I wanna give them a hard time. It's because we don't know what's happened there. And even, and it really, Kitec exists in resale houses too. And you don't know if someone has replaced the plumbing at some time in the past. And, and Kitec is a, is a product that, that was the subject of a class action lawsuit. And, and the idea is, is people who have it replace it because it has a, a high rate of failure of the connections of it are failing and, uh, and then they flood the house. John, can I ask a question? It, it's Mike. I was wondering if uh, asbestos is in the same um, type of... Yeah, I've seen some condo corporations disclose asbestos. Um, I think the reason they're disclosing asbestos is because it's, uh, it's a health risk and there is case law on, on the requirement of disclosing anything that's a health risk. Uh, generally speaking, the treatment of asbestos in, in, in case law is, um, is it's a latent, it could be a latent defect, uh, but you don't have to disclose it. So asbestos can uh, occur in floor tiles and ceiling tiles. The problem with asbestos is not that it's there. The problem with the asbestos is if you touch it and make it friable, that means airborne, that you can inhale it, then it's, it causes cancer. Uh, so there is a lot of asbestos used historically in insulation, in floor and ceiling tiles that's perfectly safe, uh, as long as you're not touching it and making it friable. So that, that's the idea behind asbestos. It needs special treatment, okay? And it needs a special team to come in with hazmat suits when they, when they deal with it. So let, let me continue with what's included in the status. This is what I review. I review the governing documents. Declaration. Declaration is like a constitution. Bylaws, rules and regulations, audited financial statement, budget. What's a budget? Budget is a financial document that's a guess. It's a guess as to what our expenses will be in the future. And based on this projection, this, this guess, we know how much money we should be collecting today to pay for our future expenses. This budget is done forward looking one year every single year. That's what a budget is, okay? Usually the budgets are pretty accurate because we have a lot of other budgets to look at in the past. And basically the, these are basic financial documents. You cannot review these documents unless you have some accounting experience or a business degree. So the, the real estate lawyer who's reviewing these documents should have some kind of a business degree or he should have some training in reviewing financial documents. Certificate of insurance, uh, shared and joint facility agreements. These are other documents. Section 98 agreements. These have to do to improvements with uh, common elements. So example, if you have a condo, condo townhouse and you built a deck outside, you would need a section 98 agreement. Otherwise, under the rules, uh, the condo corporation can ask you to take away the deck. And decks can be thousands of dollars. Or if you're in a, in a high rise and you have a terrace and you put some fancy flooring, you may also be required to have a section 98 agreement to cover your teak flooring that you put on top of the rooftop terrace. So, because you, you're not, you're not going to enjoy it much if it's just rooftop. So you need some kind of a flooring there. And a lot of buildings don't include that. Usually it has to be a flooring that's improved. That's approved. Uh, another thing that's included is a notice of future funding of the reserve fund. 
Notice the future funding of the reserve fund is also called a reserve fund study summary. They used to call it a form 15. Now we call it a notice of future funding of the reserve fund. I still see people using the form 15. It's identical. These are interchangeable terms. Uh, notice of future funding of the reserve fund is basically a document that's compiled by an engineering company that tells us what monies we're going to need for the next 25 years. Who does that? That's the house. I know my I know the roof on my house is old, but it's not leaking. When do you think I'm going to change it? I'm going to change it when it starts leaking or when I see shingles flying around. So the whole idea is is with my principal residence, which is not a condo, I have to have the five or ten thousand dollars ready to pay for a new roof. Okay, uh, in a condo corporation, it's not practical to go and, and call everyone every time you need to do a repair. You need to have the money in the account and the condo act requires a reserve fund to be kept and, and the, the directors have liability if they're not following the recommendations of the reserve fund. So this is a bank account that looks at funding that we're gonna need over the next 25 years. And based on that, we have increases almost every year, small increases. Small increases are healthy for the condo corporation because that means we're not going to have a big increase in the future. So remember, this, someone earlier said status certificate is a snapshot. Who said that? You're absolutely right, whoever said that. So I appreciate you saying that, but you were a few slides ahead of me, so I couldn't really comment much. So it's a snapshot of the present. It tells us what's happened in the past. And it also predicts for us what's gonna happen in the future. It's a document that makes predictions. It's not always accurate. It's only as good, the status certificate is only as good as the sum of its parts. So when I review a status, I do not give a pass or fail. I do not review just the status certificate. I review every single supporting document. So when people ask me how long it takes to review a status certificate, I need a minimum of two business days because half the time there's missing documents or out of date documents. And it takes a whole day to collect those documents. So we do not say pass or fail. What we say is uh, there's a bunch of documents and this is our conclusion based on the documents given. Uh, and and it, basically it's up to you to decide what you wanna do. But the main, the main uh, focus for most people is financial. Uh, what it's gonna cost them what it's going to cost them to live there, right? So the documents don't tell the full story. Uh, so you have to have kind of uh, experience reading these documents and, and, and experience with what accounting principles are. So materiality is one of the principles that we apply all the time. So even though we, we see an increase coming, is it material? Is it significantly large to affect our client? Uh, so the lawyer has to have enough time to review the status some lawyers like three days. I've heard of people asking for five days. Usually if we get all the documents at once, uh, we can usually review it in one or two days. Uh, quite often there's some documents missing. I have seen many real estate agents get a copy of the status and they'll take the form one or the form 13 and they'll scan it up and they'll post it on MLS as an attachment. Why can't I use that? It may be an indication, but it doesn't have the accompanying documents to support what they're saying. I request the full status certificate because 50% of the time I find inconsistencies and I don't wanna deal with the inconsistencies later. I'd rather deal with them now, okay? It may give us some lifestyle information about the condo corporation. So this is what's included in my basic review. So I've kind of told you what's included. I look at how recent is the status certificate and if I can use it at all. So if someone gives me a two month old status certificate, can I use it? So basically that's a good question. And I will tell you that sometimes I do use them and some, sometimes I do not use them. It all depends on my client and it de depends on how recent the documents contained in this two month old status certificate are. I'm allowed to use it because the, because the title insurance allows me to use it. But if I have a long enough closing, I will always order a new one. 
Uh, this is something that I look at all the time as soon as I review the status certificate. I look to see if the condo corporation number is the same as the condo corporation in the listing and on the offer. Because I can tell you many times I will get a status certificate with a different condo corporation number. Why is that? Property managers make mistakes and the person compiling the status certificate is the most junior person in the office. It's probably someone who doesn't even know what a status certificate is. They just know they're making piles of paper and they may switch status certificates. I see that once in a while, maybe one in 30, one in 50. I get documents mixed in from other condo corporations. I look to see if the insurance certificate is current. I can't close the deal without a current insurance certificate. And if this pops up at the last minute, there'll be a big problem with the mortgage. Mortgages do not like to have a non-current insurance certificate. I see one in 10 coming to me with an uncurrent insurance certificate. So expired or, or gonna expire before, uh, before the closing date. It's, it's easy to ask for now. It doesn't cost anything. Uh, I, this is a big area to check if the locker and parking are owned or exclusive use. The only way I can check is to review the declaration. Sometimes they're mentioned in the status, sometimes they're not. If they're owned, sometimes they're not even mentioned in the status because they may be in a sister building that share a parking garage. So is that a problem? It can be a problem. I will need an extra status just for the parking and locker if they're in a sister building. So I'm gonna actually review two status certificates. I always review these in the declaration. I look at the bylaws, rules and regulations that affect the client and affect pets. So why are pets important? Does anyone here have a pet? Would anyone move into a unit where they knew their pet was not allowed? I, I'm pretty sure everyone would say no to that. Uh, some buildings, especially older buildings, have very restrictive pet restrictions. There may be a pet restriction as to the weight of your dog. There may be a pet restriction as the type of dog. Uh, there may not, usually they allow cats, but I have seen buildings that, I, that don't allow dogs, allow cats. I have seen buildings that allow one dog or, and or one cat. Uh, but there's also a general nuisance provision for pets that I see in most of the modern buildings. And what they tell you is any pet that's a nuisance or deemed to be a nuisance by the board of directors has to be kicked out. How would you feel about that if your little dog was feeling anxious and they were barking all day while you were at work and then the, the board of directors sent you notice to get rid of your dog, how would you feel? That's a problem. I guess nowadays it doesn't matter. A lot of people are working from home. Uh, for the, there's a question from Jenny, how old can the status certificate be for title insurance? Usually two months, but they require me to uh, make an inquiry about maintenance fees, okay? And I won't use it if other documents are expired. So there may be an expired budget or there may be an expired reserve fund study, or there may be an out of date audited financials. Uh, and, and if th these documents are out of date, I won't use it, even if, even if title insurance allows me to use it, because I don't want to be dealing with expired documents. I want up to date documents. So there's no surprises. This is what I always look at, what's covered under the maintenance fees. So what's covered under the maintenance fees? Is, is heat covered? In the older buildings, heat, heat and water were covered. I owned a condo years ago that also had the electricity covered to my unit. And I hated that because there were people in the building who had commercial kitchens and they were cooking all day. It made me upset because I was subsidizing their use. We had some apartments, this was at Young and Carlton. We had some apartments that uh, were using five or $600 a month in electricity. Uh, I don't know what they had. If they were, maybe they were welding in their apartment. I don't know what they were doing but because I was on one of the committees, I could see their use was way above and beyond everyone else. That building had bulk, bulk electricity and it still does. I'm not happy about that. I look to see if the maintenance fees match what's disclosed in the listing and in the offer. Sometimes these things don't add up. So I have to look at that. I have to make sure that they match. If they don't match, then we have trouble, okay? What else is included in our review? I look to see the budget for any increases in maintenance fees. Would your client want to know about that? 
usually five bucks, 10 bucks, basically between three and 5% is a very minor mention, but I will tell them when it goes over 10%, I talk to them about it. I say, you know, there was an underfunding somewhere and you're trying to catch up. And if it's a small amount, they may be okay with it, but they may not be happy with it. So a budget is, a, is basically a, a projection as to what monies we're gonna need in the future. And when there's a, a jump in the budget, it's because we under projected, we under guessed, we guessed too low. So now someone in the future is gonna pay. Uh, I look John, at you mentioned, John, you mentioned that, um, that uh, there's no history in the status certificates regarding, uh, regarding uh, the increases. Is there anywhere we can see that kind of history and whether there yes, was? Or... There is. There, actually, there is some history. I, 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 it's not required in the disclosure document. That's called the Form 1 status. But if you look at the audited financials, uh, you're going to see mention of, under, of, uh, of uh, deficits. So the audited financials has a comment section and audited financials are historic. So they show us what happened a year ago. So you can use that to discern and to kind of divine what's going on. I always look at the audited financial comments. That reveals a lot of what has happened in the past, but it's, it's as good as the auditors, if how much detail they're gonna give us, right? I look at the reserve fund, that the annual contributions are okay, the increase in the annual contributions. I wanna see them no more than inflation. If they're more than inflation, that means that reserve fund is doing a catch up. If it's doing a catch up, really what, what's happened? Really what's happened is we're trying to pay for underfunding of the past. Uh, I look at projected balances of the reserve fund from year to year. If, if your projected balance is too low or there's catch up amounts, so it may be 30 or $50 extra every year per month, the catch up on the reserve fund the client needs to know about it because that means you have year over year increases of 30 to $50. These can add up. So I'm gonna caution you. I hope you're paying attention and not eating your breakfast because there's a test at the end of this. I'm gonna give you a test on status certificates to see if you're paying attention. And I'm gonna invite you all to participate. So I'm gonna plow along a little faster now because I only have about 10 minutes and Isabel's given me an extra 10. That's when we'll try to get the test done. So check the reserve fund study balance. I look at the cash flow table. I looked at projected increases. I look at material changes, material changes in the budget and the audited financials. I review the audit, the auditor's notes. Auditor's notes tell me a lot of what's going on. Okay, so here we're here at the, at the test. This is our case study. This is my shorter version. So we might finish it on time. So basically right now you've had an intro to how to review a status certificate. You are basically almost in the position of anyone else who has reviewed a few status certificates. You know what we're looking at. So I'm gonna give you at least five cases to try to solve as a problem. And you can vote, you can vote or you can give me your comments. So your client is buying a condo and there are multiple offers, but there's no status available. The buyer wants to make a firm offer with a big deposit, can you follow your buyer's instructions? Who says yes, who says no? Anyone, anyone brave to comment? So Ali says yes, Andy says yes, Carrie says no. Any other no's? What's the problem with following your client's instructions? So Jamal says no. Yeah, a lot more no's. Amina says no. Diane. Uh, Gulnera says no. Yeah, I like the no's. I like the no's. Uh, Ali says explain the risks. Sean says no. Okay, so basically this is a troubling situation because this is common. Uh, your client wants to buy it. They may have a friend in the building. They may have a family member in the building. They say, just put an offer in, firm deal. I don't want to make a status condition. I don't want a financing condition. How would you protect yourself from this client? Your client is 18 years old. If you suggest it, and then there's a problem afterwards, 
what will the client say? The client's going to say, Sean, you didn't explain it to me, right? And now I can't get my financing. Does, can that happen? Or now I learned about a special assessment after the closing. How do we deal with it? What's the risk? So the risk is there may be a special assessment. There may be increases. There may be lawsuits. Okay. So the problem is, is the agreement of purchase and sale does have basic protections built into the agreement. The agreement says the seller warrants and represents that there's no lawsuits or special assessments in place or contemplated. But how are we going to verify these? If someone comes to me without a status or condition, the first thing I do is I order a status. I order a status if they like it or not, because I want to protect myself and I want to protect the client as well. For a newer condo, if it's a new build, I'm not going to get audited financials and I'm not going to get a reserve fund study because they're not done. So the status will have a lot less documents. I'm not too worried about it with a new build. Uh, you can still order the status certificate without a condition because I can rely on section 13 of the agreement, but this doesn't give us the whole story of what's happened there. So my recommendation is you should order it. You should have a condition. Uh, I will tell you that if the client is adamant and they, re they insist on going firm, you should use section, you should use the agreement of purchase and sale. Uh, you should, pardon me, you should use web forms 127, form 127. Has any, anyone ever used form 127 from web forms? Gulnara says yes, Ali says yes. So some people have used form 127. I'm going to show it to you in the, in the next slide. This is what's contained in the status in, in section 13, pardon me, this is what's contained in section 13 of the agreement. So the agreement says seller represents and warrants that there are no special assessments. Uh, contemplated by the condo corporation and consents to request by the buyer, blah, blah, blah. So that's what allows us to get a status certificate. If you use Form 127, I will always order a status certificate, whether you like it or the client likes it or not, because the mortgage wants me to have a status certificate. And I, I'm doing it to protect myself from the client as well. They may say, I didn't understand. They have form, you use Form 127, then, then they're deemed to have understood. That, that's their sign off. That's what you should use. I'm not happy with people who put it in and then cross it out because the client may say, I didn't understand. They put it in and then they crossed it out. And then I, I initialed it. I don't know why, right? So part of my case study is how we can protect you from the client as well, okay? Uh, you're acting for a buyer of a condo apartment and the reserve fund study discloses annual increases. $25 year one, $30 year two, and $30 for year three. The status certificate indicates that the balance on hand is adequate. That's the form one or the form 13. Balance on hand is adequate. Your client's lawyer is now asking for $4,000 off due to chronic underfunding. Is he crazy? Is that a good lawyer or a bad lawyer? Where did he come up with $4,000 from 25 and $30? Anyone? Anyone can answer this. First, first tell me, is he, is he crazy or is he a good lawyer? Is he a bad lawyer or a good lawyer? You can say bad or good in your chat. Where does the 4,000 come from? I can tell you that on many, many, many status certificates that I review, I find occasionally uh, annual increases to the reserve fund of 25, 30, $40 that go on for years. And the reason we have these increases uh, is to prevent a special assessment, not to cover a further special, it prevents a special assessment, but in a sense, it is a special assessment. They're just not calling it a special assessment. What I call it is increases due to chronic underfunding of the reserve fund. They know they're gonna have expenses in the future. They know that if they keep the reserve fund increases according to inflation, it's not gonna be enough. 
So they figure they're going to give them little bites that no one will complain too much about. But if you have three or four year increases of $30, you're going to be $90 or $120 up. And people are not going to be happy. So if you're paying $400 a month, and then in three years or four years, you're paying $530, how will your client feel? They'll say, how did this happen? They're going to be totally surprised. So let me give you the math now, how I calculated this. So I can tell you that, generally speaking, I base it on five years. Five years is 60 months. So 60 times 25 is 1,500. Year one increase. 60 times 30 is 1,440. Not 60. Uh, um, uh, 48 times 30 is 1,440. And 36 times 30 is 1,080. That's $4,020. Why am I asking for it? Because I know we're going to pay it over the next three years. Reserve fund studies are done every three years. So the next reserve fund study may indicate more. I don't know that. But, it, but our contribution to the reserve fund never goes down. That's why I budget over five years. That's the average time most people live in a condo. That's my experience. So we're selling a condo and the status certificate reveals deficiencies. So the, the seller's lawyer, the buyer's lawyer, sends a letter and he says, the balance of the reserve fund is 500,000 less than what is projected by the cash flow table. The buyers are asking for an abatement in price based on the attached letter. This is just a paragraph from the attached letter. It says that there's two, there's two lawsuits and the lawsuits are for hundreds of thousands of dollars and there's no way for them to predict the outcome of the lawsuits. So my question to you is, is this guy being reasonable? He says, don't go ahead with a deal. This is a failure. It's a pass or fail letter. He says, do not go ahead because the, the balance of the reserve fund is 500,000 less than the cash flow table and there's lawsuits. Is this a good lawyer or a bad lawyer? Is he giving good advice? Okay, so I'm gonna tell you that he may be good and he may not be so good. So let me explain to you why, okay? Let's go look at the first, the first comment. The first comment of 500,000 less in the cash flow table of the reserve fund, the reserve fund has balances at a point in time for every year. So if it's a mid-year cash flow table, we're going to see this fluctuate. They fluctuate up and down. There's money going in and there's money going out. Sometimes, and, and in this particular case, I called the property manager and I said to him, is it true that you're $500,000 light on your reserve fund? And guess what he said to me? He said, yes, we are $500,000 light. Uh, I manage three buildings of one corporation. One corporation has three buildings and we were going to do our roofs, uh, one roof a year. And because I got a good deal to do all three roofs this year, I spent an extra 500,000, but I saved money and I'm not going to spend, I saved $250,000 on the quote. So I'm not going to spend that money next year and the following year. So that's a really good property manager. That's a good explanation of why it's light. So that means this will catch up on its own. Uh, as far as the lawsuits, is he right? We, there's no way for us to predict the outcome of these claims. So you can tell that I'm acting for the seller now. So I basically solved the first question. The second question about lawsuits kind of solved itself. Lawsuits are insurance claims. If it's covered by insurance, I usually say it's not a risk. Sometimes people will say, because who's going to pay in the end? Whether we can predict the outcome of an insurance claim or not, it doesn't matter. It's covered by the insurance. So do I care if it's a risk or not? So basically, if you said he was not a good lawyer, I would say yes, because uh, in my view, he should have called the property manager to figure them out. And he should have known that lawsuits that are caused by slip and falls are insurance covered. And they're not going to affect his, his client's uh, financial statements or future contributions other than whatever the insurance deductible is. Okay, so basically, we're not out to fail these buildings. But when you make a comment on a point, you have to make the comment and go the, and do the research that goes into making the comment. You don't just make a comment to say, I caught it.
that's not helpful. You have to find an answer. Does that make sense? So, so there's usually an answer, but it requires you to dig around a little bit. So your client is buying a condo and the status certificate only includes the form one and no reserve fund study or audited financials. And the seller has included a clause that says no holdbacks will be permitted for unassessed property tax. Can we buy this? I'm acting for the buyer and I find no reserve fund study or audited financials. Who says I can go ahead with it? Can I give it a, a green light? So at first glance, I would say no too, but read into the question. The seller has inserted a clause which says no holdbacks will be permitted for unassessed property taxes. What are they really referring to? They're saying we have a new build. It's so new, MPAC hasn't assessed the property tax. If MPAC hasn't assessed the property tax, that means it may be in the first or second year and we won't have the audited financials or the reserve fund study yet because it's too new. It's like a new baby without a history. So in this case, I will tell you, it's not a one answer fits all. We have to really look at what we're buying. I have to look and see how old the building is. If it's a three or four year old building and I don't have audited financials, that's a red flag or reserve fund study. Uh, if, if there's a clause in the offer that says no holdbacks permitted for unassessed property taxes, that's also a worry because usually the client will complain later once they get the omit bill. The omit bill usually is a lump sum payment that deals with the seller's occupancy. Uh, and that's while it was in occupancy before they owned it. So the omit bill may be five or $10,000 in some cases, and it usually falls on the buyer. Uh, the only good thing I can tell you is that title insurance does cover it, but I usually insist on a clause that allow us to do a reasonable holdback for unassessed property taxes. That's not only to protect your client, but to make you look good, right? Because if you do that, then the clients are gonna be very happy with what you're doing with their offer. Um, I can't remember if we did drafting uh, condo, resale condo offers, but that's one of my recommendations. Uh, title insurance does cover it, and it is the seller's obligation to readjust after closing. But if he if he the seller leaves the country, it's hard to get him to, to readjust. These are my coordinates. And now I'll take your questions. Anything about status certificates in general. So you can talk or you can chat. OK, big thumbs up to everyone for participating and hanging in. OK, thank you very much. Take care.